Um, it's a pleasure to have Kai Tilibach, um, who from Augsburg, who will tell us about Sullivan's relation in Rabinovitz Fleur homology and loop space homology. Please go ahead. Yes. Thanks for the introduction, Mohammed. Thanks for inviting me. Um, so uh, this is a talk. I think uh, I've talked about this topic on and off over the last two years, and uh, some of you may have heard me talk about this in one form or another. So, uh, but I hope I'll, I'll have something to add, which not everybody has seen. And uh, feel free to ask questions anytime in the middle. We are a small enough group, so I can adjust also my talk and, and steer it towards something that you're more interested in. No? So, so all this is joint work with Nancy Hingston and uh, Alexandru Wanscha, and it's uh, part of some still ongoing project of understanding more about the relation between symplectic Fleur homology and loop space homology uh, as far as algebraic structures are concerned. And our main focus in this project has been on the role that's being played by some some invariant called Rabinowitz Fleur homology, which I expect not all of you may know. So I'm also planning on spending some time uh, uh, on, expla on explaining that. Yeah. So, so correct me if, if everybody knows it, then I can skip, skip some part of it. Um, so, so my plan was roughly the following. So I will give a brief uh, recap of what is going on in string topology on the loop space side. And uh, what, uh, what are some things that left us uh, confused and puzzled for a long time? And then uh, move to, sim to symplectic homology and, and see how we whether we can set things right on symplectic homology. And we'll see that we almost can. But then uh, the upshot will be that to make everything uh, really look comp completely beautiful uh, the way we would like it to be, we, we should better uh, go move on to Rabinowitz Fleur homology. So this is uh, the rough plan of the talk. So let me start with string topology. Throughout this talk, M will be a closed oriented manifold of dimension N. Now, uh, as we've learned from Mohammed and others, uh, that uh, being oriented is not going to be really necessary if you uh, make proper use of local coefficients uh, throughout you can remove any orientability assumptions yeah but uh, i think in order not to to not go, not go into that let's assume it is oriented uh, but closed i think will be important so so i want to stick to that and uh, the circle i will always write as r mod z and then the loop space lambda uh, will be the smooth maps from S1 to M. And also important will be the subspace uh, of this consisting of all the constant loops, which I will denote by lambda zero. Now, uh, Charles and Sullivan in their 99 paper named string topology introduced a bunch of operations on loop space homology and on equivariant loop space homology. So in this talk, I will entirely talk about the non-equivariant case. So, there's also a whole story in the S1 equivariant case, uh, which I will not talk about today. And uh, the basic operation that we have on the usual loop space homology, homology of the loop space, uh, is uh, the loop product, also called the Charles Sullivan product, which is an operation of degree minus n. And the schematic picture is this one. You should read it as follows. You take uh, two chains in the loop space. So, so two chains of loops, two families of loops, uh, now those loops are parametrized, so there, there's a there's a time zero on on both of those loops, and then you look at the subset of the product of the domains of those two chains, where the evaluation at time zero coincide, and where they coincide, you can concatenate the two loops and make out of the two loops one loop, and this defines you on chain level if the two chains are transverse to each other. Uh, an operation which descends to homology and on homology give you a product of degree minus n. And uh, this has been studied a lot and there's been computations of this product. Uh, also, uh, shortly after, Dennis Sullivan suggested that sh there should also be a natural co-product, which was then uh, further studied by uh, Goreski and Hingston in their 2009 paper with applications uh, to, to growth of a uh, number of closed geodesics and the like. And uh, this is defined by a completely dual picture. So now you, it's, 
you want to define a co-product, so you, we start with one chain on the loop space, and then we look at the evaluation at time zero and the evaluation at time s for some s between zero and one, and uh, we take the subdomain uh, where those two evaluations coincide, where the evaluation at zero and at time s coincide. Uh, this is again some co-dimension n condition, but uh, yes, right. And then on that subdomain, we can uh, decompose this loop because then we can go along the loop from time zero to time s, but at time s, we're back at the same point. So this is actually a loop. And then there's a second loop uh, going from time s up all the way up to time one. So we get then a map from some chain, fr from some domain into the product of loop spaces. And when you pass to homology and apply Kernet formula, you get something in the tensor product uh, of the homology of loop space with itself. Yes. Now, uh, and I'll, I'll come to, to this just a second. Um, Yeah, okay, maybe I comment on this right now. So this, uh, why do I divide out the space of constant loops here? Because uh, as S tends to zero or one, we have uh, some problem because then the situation is not transverse. And I'll come back to this more precisely, but, but this uh, forces you, because you see if, if S is equal to zero, then of course the evaluation at zero and at S then agrees always. Yeah, so, so then I can always decompose the loop into a constant loop and the original loop. And likewise, when S is equal to one. So, so I, I get two boundary terms, but then the intuition is okay. Yeah, but those boundary terms, they consist of one constant loop and some other loop. So if I mod out all the constant loops, then uh, those boundary terms won't matter and I'll be fine. But I'll come back to that, how, how to do this more precisely. Yeah, but, but just, just take away that we need to do something. So we cannot just define it on the loop space homology without further adjustments. But, and Sullivan's suggestion was to mod out the constant loops. And that's also what Goreski and Kingston worked with. Yeah. All right. And the degree is one minus n. Why? Because we add one parameter s, which is varying freely between zero and one, and then a co-dimension n condition. Yeah. So this is a co-product. All right. Now, in his uh, paper where he introduced this operation, Dennis Sullivan suggests that this, this operation together with uh, the loop product uh, should uh, satisfy some algebraic relations, namely those of an infinitesimal bialgebra. Sullivan called it differently, but after some literature search by Alex, uh, he traced down uh, that there, is, uh, there was something already appearing in the literature by Joni Rota and by Aguiar, uh, uh, they, they define some algebraic structure called an infinitesimal bialgebra. And this is precisely what you expect to get. It consists of a product and a co-product such on homology, such as the product is associative and commutative. So everything is graded, of course. Uh, the co-product is co-associative and co-commutative. And they satisfy some compatibility relation which uh, we somehow came to call Sullivan's relation. I'm not sure uh, whether Dennis Sullivan would approve, uh, but uh, since we spent so much time discussing this relation and we always called it that, so, so I stick to that name. And uh, Sullivan's relation, here, here it's written algebraically. So it's, uh, it's a relation which takes uh, two tensor powers as input and two tensor powers as output. And you can either first apply the product and then the co-product, or you, you, do, you apply identity on one component co-product and then uh, identity tensor product and the other way around. Here's a schematic picture why you expect this to be true. So let's look at the left-hand side. We take two chains in the loop space and we apply the product to that. So, so we get uh, this picture, which I drew before for the product from you. Yeah, so, so this is... Uh, when you apply the operation mu to two chains, this is what you get. And then you want, want to apply lambda afterwards. What does lambda say? It says you take the evaluation at time zero. So time zero is, uh, is here, yeah? You take the evaluation at time zero and, and then the evaluation at some other time. 
and uh, ask where they coincide, and then you decompose. Now, now this other time, S could be on, on the first or on the second loop uh, coming from your original uh, two chains in loop space. Yeah? And that gives you two terms. So, so if the second uh, time S at which you evaluate lies on this first, so, so if your S is equal, is, is sitting here, then it means you, uh, you run from zero to S, that is a loop, and then you go from S all the way to one, which means you run around here and you run around the second loop. Yeah? And I denoted it that this, this is the first loop and those two together give you the second loop, which is the outcome of the co-product. And, uh, and likewise, uh, you do it the other way. And then you see that those two terms on the right-hand side, you can interpret as some other terms. Namely, you can interpret this one as first applying the co-product to this first chain and afterwards applying the product and the other way around. Yeah, so, so this uh, on the picture level is completely clear this relation should hold. Okay. Now, now the first question that arises is on which space should this relation even hold? Because as I uh, pointed out, lambda cannot in general be defined just on the whole loop space homology. You want to mod out something, okay? And I'll be more precise about this later. And uh, now you could think, okay, let's do it the other way around. Let's just, um, let's just mod out the constant loop so lambda is well defined and then just descend mu to the constant loops. Now this also doesn't work because in general, uh, for this to work, some of the sub, the sub complex consisting of constant loops should be an ideal for mu, such that mu descends to the quotient by, uh, by the constant loops. And here's an example which shows that this is in general not the case. So let's take the torus, the n torus. You can even take n equals one, there already it happens. Uh, and uh, let's take a, a zero uh, chain, which is just one constant loop. So, so let's fix one point and take the constant loop sitting at that point as a, as a degree zero chain in loop space. Uh, and then there's a natural n chain. If we fix some direction, let's say that we fix the s1, the x1 direction, and then let's take the straight lines in the x1 direction with all possible uh, starting points. That gives you a tn worth of loops. So this is an this is an n chain with with domain tn into the loop space, yeah, consisting of all those loops. And now let's take the the loop product of uh, those two chains. Well, we need to evaluate at zero and uh, look where they coincide. And of course, there is a in this whole n chain, there's a unique one which is precisely starting at time zero at the point Q naught, and then it's going around. Yeah. So, so mu of these guys uh, consists of a, a single loop going once around in the x one direction. So it's again a zero chain as it should be, uh, but it is not constant. It's a zero chain, but it's not in the constant loops. So the subcomplex of the constant loops is not an ideal, and uh, this uh, uh, leads to the fact that the, uh, the product does not descend to this quotient. Yeah. So, so this is also not an option. Uh, so so we, we should find some space in between on which lambda is defined and the product uh, descends. Okay, and there is such a space. So this is, our, this is the first result that I want to mention. And I'm going to uh, sketch how, how this follows. We claim that both these operations, mu and lambda, can be defined on what we call reduced loop space homology. Now, algebraic topologists won't like that because it is not what in topology you call reduced homology, the homology relative to a point. Now here, we take the homology relative to Euler characteristic times a point. So chi is the Euler characteristic of M. And we, we, we take the complex where we mod out uh, the Euler characteristic times a base point. We fix some base point. We take uh, the class of this base point times Euler characteristic and mod that out. Take the homology of that complex 
I, I think I've written it other, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it, it's equivalent uh, isomorphic to what I wrote. And let's call that reduced homology. For example, if the Euler characteristic happens to be zero, then we're not modding out anything. Then it is actually the full loop space homology, just. Yeah? Um, and we claim that on that space, you can define lambda, the, the co-product, and also the product descends to this one. And I also claim that this is the unique space that is somehow, so, so this space is sitting somewhere in between the loop space homology and the, uh, the homology mod constant loops. Yeah, so we divide out something, uh, we divide one constant loop times all the characteristics, but, but not all constant loops. Okay, and so we claim we can bo define both of them in such a way that they also satisfy Sullivan's relation. Right. Okay. Hi, can I ask so, a question? Yes, sure. So I should have asked it on the first slide, but in the definition of the loop product, since we're working with unbased loops, um, what, what are we doing about the fact that the two loops you're taking the product of may not send zero to the same thing? No, they don't. So again, uh, yeah, I, I, I did not spell this out. So, so, so you, you take two chains in, in two chains in loop space. So those are two maps from some domains into the loop space. Yes. Let's say there's some domain, uh, I don't know, D1 and D2 into loop space, two chains. And then in the product D1 times D2, you choose those parameter values at which the loops coincide at time zero. So that is in the product of the two domains, that is a co-dimension N sub subspace in there. And over that space where the evaluation at time zero coincides, there you can concatenate. Okay, and that's what you do. Okay, okay. and, and you, yes. you think a bit about um, arranging so that that's a, a nice locus where... Yes, you need, to, you need to look at the evaluation of both chains at zero. This is a map to M times M and that evaluation map wants to be transverse to the diagonal. So you need to perturb one of the loops in order to arrange that condition and then, then you can define it. And, uh, and then, yeah, and then you prove that what you get is actually, first of all, it's a nice enough domain. It's some manifold with boundary and corners and, and it will not, it will actually be closed if the original two, uh, two chains were cycles and hence defines your homology class. And then you also prove that the homology class does not depend on whatever perturbation you chose. So there's, there's some work to be done in the background. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so now let me actually write out the definition of the co-product. Uh, so this actually relates to Nate's uh, question now for the co-product, you have a similar thing. So, so we start, uh, with one chain, so it's uh, it's a map A from some domain, say a simplex Ka into the loop space, and then I define a subset of Ka times zero one, namely all those x comma s such that A of x evaluated at time s equals A of x evaluated at time zero. Yeah, and again I assume that. Uh, that this is a transversely cut out condition so that this is in fact a nice co-dimension n submanifold with boundary and corners. And then over that, I can now decompose because I can take the loop restricted to zero s or I can restrict it to s to, to time s equal from s to one. And this way I get two chains and, and this uh, then uh, gives you the class of the co-product. Yes. Now, the problem is that precisely this transversality condition, which works fine for the product case. So, so everything I said in answer to Nate's question is true in the product case. Now here in the co-product case, this is not quite true because this is definitely not transversely cut out at S equals zero or one. Yeah. So we need to do something there and we actually need to do something even if we want to mod out the constant loops. Well, we still need to at least get a reasonably defined domain to, to get a chain in the first place, yeah. Uh, that chain then might have boundaries, which we can then ignore if we mod out constant loops. But I think even in that case, we need to do something, yeah. And uh, here's, uh, here's one way of doing it. Uh, namely, we, we can do it by 
perturbing this condition. So this, this condition that the evaluation at time s should be the evaluation at time zero uh, is not transversely cut out when s moves to zero or one, but we're going to replace this by a different condition. You can think about it this way. This means that the evaluation map at time zero and s here is landing in the diagonal and we deform the diagonal. And how do you deform the diagonal? You deform the diagonal by uh, a small diffeomorphism close to the identity. So, so let's do just that. So let's pick a small vector field V on M uh, with non-degenerate zeros. Let's denote its flow by FT and by F its time one map of the flow. So this is a diffeomorphism which will be close to the identity V small. And then for every point Q, we denote by pi q uh, the path going from q to f of q, just following the flow, just moving by ft of q, and pi q inverse is the path going the opposite direction. Yes, and uh, now we redefine the domain for for the co-product. I'm writing exactly the same as before, but I'm inserting an f here. So I want the evaluation at time s to be f of the evaluation at time zero. Yeah, this precisely means I'm replacing the diagonal by the graph of f. Okay. And, uh, and then now, of, so, so what is now the condition? So the condition is that if I take the evaluation of this loop at time s, it is not equal to the evaluation at zero, but it is equal to f of the evaluation at zero. So, so which means if I restrict to this portion, it is not quite a loop. It doesn't quite close up, but I can close it up canonically. I just follow the loop until time s, and then I go along this pi inverse, along this canonical path pi, which is given to us uh, by this flow. Yeah. So there's a canonical way to close it up to a loop. And also then I can restart here and I follow this path pi, and then I follow the rest of the loop around here. This is my second loop. Okay, so I can still canonically decompose it into two loops. And that's, that's just what's, what's written here, yeah? So, so I, I take over this domain, then I take the first loop, I go until time s, and then I go back by this canonical path, or I go by this canonical path and take follow the rest of the loop. Okay, so, so this is a definition and uh, you can then check, I mean, we prove that then uh, this is transversely cut out. If your uh, vector field V has non-degenerate zeros, then this will be transversely cut out S at S equals zero and S equals one. Now that at the other values of S is transversely cut out, this is a further just uh, uh, generosity condition which you arrange, yeah? Okay, so, so this, this is good. Now, What is actually happening at s equals zero and s equals one now? First of all, it's transversely cut out. That's uh, one good thing, but we can also understand what is the boundary term actually, because the boundary condition, if s is equal to zero, let's look at this again, then the evaluation at time zero should be f of the evaluation at time zero, which means that uh, the evaluation at time zero should be a fixed point of f, yes? but fixed points of F are just zeros of this vector field, if the vector field is sufficiently small. Yeah, so we're not getting some, some further fixed points. And um, so, so we see that the boundary terms in fact sit at the zeros of this vector field. So uh, at the boundary, we, we find some loops which are which are constant, yeah, because, uh, yes, yes, they will actually be constant. So we could decompose into a constant loop and some non-constant loop at s equals zero, s equals one. But this constant loop is not sitting anywhere, but it is precisely sitting at one of the zeros of this vector field. And now it's just some fiddling around 
uh, by saying, okay, I, I think we should say it maybe in a better way, but so far we're saying something like, okay, let's choose all the zeros of V to be very close to this base point Q0 and identify them so uh, with Q0 uh, in the complex. And so that uh, really I can view the boundary as landing in something tensor Q0 or Q0 tensor something. Yeah, so by identifying all those zeros uh, with the base point itself. And now we can even count like how, what does every zero of the vector field contribute to, to this count now? Now it's just every zero contributes something. And uh, when, you, when you write it down locally, you'll see that it contributes precisely the index of the vector field at zero. So what we will find is in fact that the, if you sum all the contributions that you get at the boundary, you sum over the zeros of the vector field, its indices, which uh, by poincare hopf just gives you the Euler characteristic of the manifold. So, so which means that the boundary terms actually land in Euler characteristic time space point times Q0. One of the two factors is Euler characteristic times the base point. Yeah. And, and this means that the coproduct will be well defined if we mod that out, because those are additional boundary terms that we don't want to see, which would screw up this, uh, this being a cycle, uh, these boundary terms at S equals zero and S equals one. But if we mod out this subcomplex generated by Euler characteristic times the base point, then those two boundary terms die. And uh, this domain for the coproduct actually becomes a cycle and uh, it then it defines a homology class. Yeah. So so this shows that the coproduct is actually well defined uh, in when we mod out Euler characteristic times the base point. And now it is uh, a similar discussion to check that the product in fact descends to uh, to this quotient complex. Okay. So so I. I explained everything working with singular chains. This is in reality not what we do. As usual, it is more convenient to actually work with the MOS complex on the loop space because uh, somehow this is <laughs> this is uh, countably generated and so on. And it's it's, it's just uh, easier to work with technically. Hmm? Okay, and and then of course one also needs to check Sullivan's relation. And yeah, but this can be done. It's a more or less straightforward check. Any questions about this? Okay. So so now this was this is a talk that I gave a couple of times uh, about uh, until maybe about a year ago, and I was always very happy and and uh, satisfied with ourselves that we had resolved this issue completely. And here's also a nice example where we compute everything and it works out nicely and beautifully. Let's take uh, the manifold S3. You could also take any uh, odd dimensional sphere. It works also for even dimensional spheres. And, uh, and then Cohen, Jones, and Yen have uh, worked out for us uh, the ring structure with respect to the loop product. So first of all, the, they compute the homology and then they even give it to us as a ring with respect to the loop product. And it turns out it's an exterior algebra on two generators. Uh, one generator of odd degree, you, you're degree shifting such that the product is sitting in degree zero here. So you're shifting by three, all the degrees. And uh, so that's why you get a generator of degree minus three. This corresponds to the point class. Yeah, uh, but it's an odd generator. So it squares to zero in this algebra. And there's another generator after shifting of degree plus two and it's uh, ex free exterior algebra on those two generators. And uh, then we can work out what the coproduct is. And the coproduct, here's formulas for the coproduct, and you can check it satisfies all the relations of an infinitesimal bialgebra that we want. Hmm? All right. Uh, I don't, let me not spend time on that example because uh, there was now a supposedly much simpler example, which, which we had overlooked uh, for a long time until last fall, I spent some time at Institute Mittag Leffler and gave a talk about that. And then some people uh, started uh, asking nasty questions and uh, forced me to think about this as one case more 
carefully. And when I did that, I found out that the situation is not quite as nice as we were expecting it to be. So, so what is happening for the manifold being the circle? Of course, we can still work out everything here. So the homology of uh, the loop space of S1 uh, is generated by two sets of generators. So generators in geometric degree zero, which I call AK, which are just rigid loops, and they go K times around the circle. K is the winding number around the circle. Or we have generators of degree one going K times around the circle. So they all go K times around the circle, but the base point is also moving once around the circle. So, so those, are, those are the two generators for the homology of the circle. And uh, yeah, so, so here's actually explicit formulas uh, for cycles uh, representing those homology classes. And the loop product has geometric degree minus one here because the dimension is one and you can work it out. Uh, so a times a k times a l is equal to zero and the mixed terms look like this and b k times b l is b k plus l. It's kind of clear if you do a loop product, the winding numbers will add up because uh, you wind around k times in one loop, l times, and then you concatenate. So the winding numbers are going to wind, uh, going to uh, add up. So this is what you get. Yeah. Okay. Then and then, let's define the loop coproduct. Now to define it, we need to choose some vector field. Here, the Euler characteristic is zero, so we can actually choose a vector field which doesn't have any zeros at all. So we don't have to mod out anything, right? Okay, uh, but and this is um, first thing that you notice. Of course, there's two choices really of this vector field, right? You can you can have it point this way, or you can have it point that way along the circle to to get a no, nowhere vanishing vector field. Yeah. So up to homotopy, there's two choices of such vector fields. Okay. So so let's let's just uh, take both of them and work out. If with one choice or the other, if I define the coproduct, what do I get? All right, okay. And here everything is nice and simple because the flow of this vector field uh, is is easily computed. Yeah, so it's just moving x to x plus or minus epsilon, and uh, and then uh, you can sit down and compute the coproduct. So so never mind the precise formula. So here are the for formulas for on all the generators of the coproduct. Uh, so I call it lambda plus when I compute with respect to the vector field V plus. So this is on generators AK and BK. And then I also compute it for this other vector field, lambda minus pointing the opposite direction. And, uh, and now there, there's an unpleasant surprise because you see here, if you take lambda of the generator AK, you get a sum from i equals zero to k minus one of a i tends to a k minus i. And here you get a sum from i equals one to k of a i tends to a k minus i. Yeah. And, uh, and this is, uh, well, yeah, if you, it's kind, kind of to be expected because you are, you're shifting away the boundary components at s equals zero, say, and, uh, and if you move your vector field slightly to the right, you will get a contribution. If you move it slightly to the other side, you will not get a contribution, but rather you will get a contribution close to S equals one. And, and they just need to the product coming out different. And this is already the result on homology. Yeah. Uh, so, so they are, yeah, it's not just some chain level thing which becomes equal on homology, but they are really different on homology. Yeah, they're both well-defined. They both satisfy Sullivan's relation, which is following from our more general theorem, which I stated. And this is true in this case, you can check directly. Yeah, but they are different. Okay, well, this was a bit of a surprise, but then it was getting worse. Namely, uh, then uh, at some moment I started uh, doing more computations and I realized, okay, they do sat satisfy Sullivan's relation with the product, but uh, they, are in fact neither co-commutative nor co-associative. So both of them, lambda plus or lambda minus, they are not co-commutative, they are not co-associative. Um, there's a question in the chat, I think by, uh, so aren't those two sums the same? No, they are not, yes, because uh, there's, a, there's a term say with, with i equals zero, up here, 
which is not appearing down here. Yeah. But that's the K downstairs, right? It's just, or, or is the point that like there is a well-defined left and right and you can't. Yes, there is a well-defined left and right. Yes. There is a well-defined left and right. Ah. It, it is landing in the tensor product. There is a well-defined left and right. Sorry, yeah. Kai, maybe, maybe, maybe it's true that if you take S1 and you apply the reflection, uh -huh. then the two operations are mapped to each other. I think so, yes. Right, but they're mm -hmm. not the same. Mm -hmm. Denis has a question. Uh -huh. So I was wondering if this is a side effect of using a vector field. Um, and if one were to average these two, imagine instead smudging through something like a differential form or a density, something that is smooth rather than a discrete data, mm -hmm. that'd be better. Yes, I think I also had that idea uh, as a matter of fact, and I played around with that also. So I also computed the average of the two and I also tried other combinations. And uh, uh, indeed, uh, if you average the two, you clearly make it co-commutative. And uh, I think if I, if I remember correctly, I think you can also make it then to become co-associative, but then you lose Sullivan's relation. <laughs> and uh, okay. whatever I tried, I, I did not succeed in the case of S1 to write down a, a co-product which satisfies all the relations that I want. Uh, so, um, and I, I also have not found a correct way of phrasing it as a mathematical uh, theorem, like, uh, but I, I think I, I should maybe with some work be able to make it a, a precise statement that it's not possible. It seems to me it's not possible that you satisfy all the relations there. This is, uh, yeah. Yeah, um, right. Okay, so so this was any any further questions on this one? So this this is what we learned about the loop space side. So so everything so far we worked completely on the loop space side. Yeah. Now. Now then, being a symplectic geometer, uh, if I'm stuck with some questions on the loop space side, then I, I turn to Fleur homology. Right? because the homology is usually easier and uh, well, or maybe <laughs> at least uh, for me it's easier. Yeah, so, um, and you can mirror the whole discussion on the level of Fleur homology on the cotangent bundle of the manifold M and, uh, or more precisely on the level of symplectic homology. So if you're not familiar with symplectic homology, you can think of symplectic homology as the Fleur homology of a quadratic Hamiltonian, fiberwise quadratic Hamiltonian on the cotangent bundle. Or closer to the original definition, you take some Hamiltonians which are of this shape that I drew here. So let's say V is our Liouville domain. In, in, in the situation I'm interested here, V will be the unit disk cotangent bundle, the completion will be the whole cotangent bundle. And then you take a Hamiltonian, which is roughly zero up to radius one, and then it's increasing linear with some slope, and then you make the slope larger and larger, take some direct limit. Now, now with this definition, it is better if you want to define operations on that. And this is something that we learned from uh, many people. Uh, first of all, on the level of Fleur homology was Matthias Schwarz and then Paul Seidel explained how to upgrade it to the level of symplectic homology and then it was worked out further by Alex Ritter and other people. I'm sure Mohammed also had some contribution in this. Yeah. So, uh, and there's in general, you get uh, certain TQFT operations associating to Riemann surfaces with cylindrical lens. Um, and uh, let me, say a little bit more precisely how this works. Uh, um, what you do is here on the left is a Riemann surface with cylindrical ends. I group them as positive and negative functions. So, so either I glue in a positive half cylinder going to plus infinity or a negative half cylinder, which conformally uh, has no meaning, but uh, it will have meaning when I map it. Uh, to, uh, to the completion of my Liouville domain, because I will insist, yeah, okay, it will be different behavior here. And, um, and then we want to study solutions of this 
type of equation, which is a perturbation of the Cauchy-Riemann equation. If I didn't have this term here, then this would just mean that U is holomorphic. U is from a Riemann surface into the completion of this Liouville domain. As usual, you pick an almost complex structure on that Liouville domain, which I didn't mention even. Yeah, but then you perturb this equation by the Hamiltonian vector field, but the Hamiltonian vector field is not an intrinsic object on that surface, on that Riemann surface, but you can make it an object on the Riemann surface if you tensor it with a one form on, this, on that surface. And then you get something which is on an equal footing with du here, and you can take the zero one part of this. And for compactness to work out nicely, you want this one form to satisfy d beta less or equal to zero with some, some sign conventions. And also at the cylindrical ends, you want this beta to be a multiple of dt, so that on the cylindrical ends, you see an ordinary Fleur equation. Now, you can give yourself a little bit of freedom by saying beta is not exactly dt, but some weight, some positive number times dt. And uh, yeah, and those, uh, and then you see that if you want to have d beta less or equal to zero and beta is equal to uh, some numbers bi times dt or ai times dt at the positive or negative punctures, by Stokes' theorem, this is only possible if the sum of the negative weight of the weights at the negative punctures is greater or equal to the sum of the weights at the positive punctures. Yeah? This, uh, and then this is possible. Once, once you have this condition, then you find such a beta in this if and only if. This is the only thing I want to take away from this slide. There's some condition on the uh, on the weights you need to put at the punctures. And this is responsible for this not giving you a full CQFT structure, but only what some people call the non-compact CQFT structure. For example, you always need at least one negative puncture. Yeah. All right. And now you can play the whole game here. There's a natural pair of pens product where you take as your surface sigma just a pair of pens with two positive puncture, one negative puncture. I need to throw in the weight such that this is possible according to our uh, our inequality. And then you count those guys and this defines your product of degree minus n with, with all the properties you like. This has been known for decades. Now, you can also define a secondary co-product. This is the, what gives you the interesting one. You can define a primary coproduct by just inverting the pair of pens and counting rigid things, and you see that it's mostly trivial. So what you want to do is you want to define a secondary operation where you introduce an additional parameter. And let me explain how this works. So you... Um, yeah, let me just go to the picture. So here's the definition of this secondary pair of pens product. Um, you look at inverted pair of pens, you put some weights, uh, say one, two, two, it doesn't matter so much. And then uh, what you, 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 you deform the one form beta, uh, depending on some parameter A varying between zero and one. And at A equals zero, the one form beta is deformed in such a way that on this part of the surface, uh, it has weights one, two, and minus one. And then on the remaining cylindrical part, it goes from weight minus one to weight two. Yeah. And, and then at the other end, it's doing the same thing at the other output. So it's, uh, yeah, so, so this is uh, a deformation of the one form. So the, yeah, of the one form beta. And then, you count uh, solutions of the Fleur equation over these domains, depending on this, uh, with this parameter A also varying. So it's, it's part of the, uh, the moduli space. So that's why, because you have an additional parameter, you get an operation of degree one minus N, and this is the correct secondary uh, co-product. Uh, and then you can, okay, just one sec. Uh, and this will be well defined. So, so what, what is happening at these endpoints here? Here you see a cylinder going with weight minus one to weight two. What does it mean? It means that here you are you're taking an input from the Hamiltonian minus h, and you're taking an output in the complex for the Hamiltonian two h. 
Yes. So, so you're taking your Hamiltonian, which is linearly upward sloping, but you take minus h. So you take it downward sloping, and then you take a continuation map where you increase it. And, and this continuation map is what is described by this cylinder. So the two ends here at zero and one uh, land in a complex which, where one of the two components is in the image of this continuation map. Therefore, if we divide out the image of this continuation map, uh, we'll get a well-defined co-product there. This is uh, what is what is becoming on Fleur homology. So if I define reduced Fleur homology by taking Fleur homology modulo the image of the continuation map, then pass to the direct limit over Hamiltonians, make it uh, uh, go to infinity, then call this the reduced symplectic homology. Then on that uh, space, this will be a well-defined co-product. Yeah. Where this continuation map is, as I said, it's the continuation map going from minus h to 2h by, by a monotone homotopy and counting Fleur cylinders there. Okay. Now, now let's understand what we're actually dividing out here. Yeah, it turns out we're not dividing out all that much because this continuation map is in fact something uh, rather simple. In, now let's specialize to our case of interest, namely uh, V is the unit disk cotangent bundle in the cotangent bundle of some manifold. And it turns out that this continuation map in fact lives only in degree zero and it factors through the constant loop part. And on the constant loop part, you know symplectic homology in action close to zero becomes singular homology or cohomology depending on your conventions yeah and uh, when you work out the degrees it means that on one hand on one hand you get degree n homology of m and you get degree zero homology of m this comes from the hamiltonian minus h this comes from the hamiltonian plus h i may have used poincare duality uh, implicitly there uh, and then you work out that what this map is and this map is in fact the cap product with the euler class of m so the, with the Euler class of the tangent bundle of M. Now, M, I assume M is oriented to make it simple. So then this is the integers, this is the integers, and this is just multiplying by the Euler characteristic. So, so we see that this reduced homology really is precisely reproducing our reduced loop space homology if we uh, push it through the uh, Viterbo isomorphism. So the symplectic homology of the cotangent bundle is the loop space homology. And if we take this reduced symplectic homology, then we precisely get the loop space homology modulo Euler characteristic times the point class. So it fits perfectly. Yeah, so, so we also have a nice definition of product and co-product on the symplectic homology side, which is compatible with what we had on the loop space side through beta both isomorphism. And now second theorem is what you expect and it works uh, out as expected. Uh, the two operations can be defined on reduced symplectic homology. I described the co-product, but the product descends also to this uh, reduced symplectic homology such that they satisfy Sullivan's relation and Viterbo's isomorphism intertwines both of them with the corresponding string topology operations. This was known for the product. This is old work of Abondandlo and Schwarz. It had not been spelled out for the co-product, but it is more or less straightforward to adapt the argument. Once you have a proper definition of the co-product, then you go through similar arguments as for the product to prove it. It is compatible under Viterbo's isomorphism. Yeah. All right. But now, of course, you will have the same deficiency still on symplectic homology side, namely if you apply it now to the underlying manifold M1, uh, S1, take its cotangent bundle, then also the co-product on symplectic homology will not be commutative and not be co-associative because it is not uh, on the loop space side yeah, where we computed it. So, so it's not solving our problem. Yeah? And it will also depend on choices. Now, it took us a while to figure out where the choices are in the symplectic homology uh, definition. And uh, the choices are hidden in the continuation map because when you, when you, in, but in fact, this is something that we probably wouldn't even have noticed had we not been 
want from the loop space side that something was bound to happen there. But but it it turns out that uh, in order to get the well-defined count uh, and to achieve transversality for this uh, continuation map, then you precisely have a problem when you take as input a constant loop and take as output the same constant loop and you count and and uh, and then uh, it is uh, this is not transversely cut out and you need to make a further perturbation to have this continuation map well defined and one way to get to do this further perturbation is by deforming with a vector field as we as we do uh, on the loop space side and uh, when you do that then then in fact it will be everything will be consistent so it's kind of hidden in the precise definition of this continuation map yeah the all right, okay, and now I have uh, 10 minutes. Now let me tell you where everything becomes uh, nice and beautiful. And that is when you pass to Rabinovitz flow homology. Unless there's any questions on this part. I have questions, but I'll wait till the end. Okay, great. Okay, then I can actually say something in, on Rabinovitz flow. Now, Rabinovitz flow homology was originally introduced by Urs Frauenfeld and myself. Uh, as a homology of some Lagrange multiplier functional, but then uh, this is usually not uh, the form in which we're using it. I will call it Rabinovitz Fleur homology, but we're using it in the form which was then later worked together with Alex Wancher, where we reinterpreted it as some variant of symplectic homology, just using some new shape of Hamiltonians, namely what we call V shape Hamiltonians, Hamiltonians which start out very high up, then they go down and they go up again. So you see a V-shaped Hamiltonian here. Yeah. So, so you, so, yeah. So in contrast to symplectic homology, where the Hamiltonian starts are just being zero and then sloping upwards, here it's sloping down and upwards. So we find uh, additional generators. So we find one group of generators appearing here of periodic orbits of this, of one periodic orbits of these Hamiltonians. Now, this will push up so high that it falls out of any fixed action window. So they will actually not contribute to the complex. And here we will find generators like those for symplectic homology, but then we'll also find things where the slope is going down. And they will also be generators for this Rabinovitz uh, Fleur complex. Uh, and Therefore, it will give you a quite different homology. But this picture already suggests that it looks like it roughly is a complex for symplectic homology and then a complex for symplectic cohomology, where you see the same generators, but just now with the slope going downwards. Yeah? And this is, in fact, uh, more or less true. So here's a precise statement. You, you define the... Uh, uh, Fleur homology of such Hamiltonians take a direct limit, and this is the definition of Rabinowitz Fleur homology. And it fits in a long exact sequence with symplectic homology and symplectic cohomology, and with some connecting map between symplectic cohomology and symplectic homology, which is precisely this continuation map that appeared earlier. Because if you think of symplectic cohomology as a Fleur homology of, of a downward sloping Hamiltonian, and then you do a continuation map to an upward sloping Hamiltonian. And that is the, that is the connecting morphism here. Yeah? And we've seen that this connecting morphism is almost trivial. It's only seeing some contribution at a point class. Yeah? So, so that means that Rabinowitz Fleur homology is almost the direct sum of symplectic homology and symplectic cohomology. And and if we, in fact, pass to reduced symplectic homology and cohomology by saying symplectic homology is the co-kernel of, of this continuation map and symplectic cohomology is, the, is its kernel, then uh, the long exact sequence becomes a short exact sequence and this splits as vector spaces. Yeah? Okay, let, let's take field coefficients. And I mean, I could say more about other coefficients, but let's say it splits as vector spaces. Yeah. Um, okay. So, okay. So, so it it seems like okay. We're not really seeing anything new here. We're just seeing reduced symplectic homology, reduced symplectic cohomology. But the beautiful thing is that here on Rabinowitz Fleur homology, we in fact see the full structure of a product and a coproduct satisfying all the relations of an infinitesimal. 
by algebra that we were dreaming of. So if you take Rabinowitz Fleur homology, uh, you degree shift it so that the product lands in degree zero, then this is an infinitesimal by algebra where the product is defined again by a pair of pants product. Um, you can define for, you, you define the pair of pants product the same way as I explained before. Now you just use these strange shapes of Hamiltonians and you need to convince yourself that it still goes through if Hamiltonians have that shape. So you still get a well-defined pair of pants product. You also define the secondary pair of pants co-product the same way I did before. But now it turns out that uh, now they satisfy all the relations of an infinitesimal bialgebra and they are also independent of all choices. And in the remaining uh, four minutes, I want to at least indicate why suddenly all the difficulties we had before vanish when we pass to Rabinowitz Fleur. And the, uh, and the, the beauty of it is that when you look at the continuation map, then it looks as follows. Now we're having these V-shaped Hamiltonians. This is our V-shaped Hamiltonian H, starting high up, going down, and going back up. This computes the symplectic homology. Now, this, we, we, we flip it. So this is minus H. This is the one which computes symplectic cohomology. And then we need to take a continuation map from this Hamiltonian to that one. And we can do the continuation map such that we do it as follows. We take this Hamiltonian, and then we first move, move up this bit until we are seeing this kind of shape. And then from here, we move up this bit. We move it upwards until we see this shape H, right? But now, so that means that the continuation map from the Fleur homology of minus H to the Fleur homology of H for this V-shaped Hamiltonian factors through the Fleur homology of this Hamiltonian, which we call L in between, because it's just linear downward sloping. But, but this has no generators whatsoever. There's some generators appearing up here, but as I explained before, we pick, we fix an action window, so they their actions lie outside. They don't care. They don't matter. Now the slope is something not in the action spectrum. So there's, there's absolutely no generator here. So, which means that this continuation map is just canonically zero on the nose. Yeah, we, and this is in contrast to the continuation map for symplectic homology, where we, it was factoring through the constant loops and we needed to perturb by some vector field and we get some count and, and then this count, it might then depend on how we perturb and we run into all those difficulties. Now here we don't need to do any of that. It's, it is just zero on the nose. And I think this is, this is the main uh, thing that I wanted to convey today. Yeah, I think this is, this is the main picture. And then once you see that, then you see this is well-defined and independent of all choices, it's just zero. And now you go through all the relations. So there's, uh, uh, Alex uh, did a lot of work and I mean, there's things you need to prove. So here's, a, here's Alex's picture proof of Sullivan's relation now on Rabinowitz Fleur homology where this picture, you should see it has two positive functions, one negative. So this is applying the product and then the co-product and then you need to deform it in ways to see the other guys. And then you see some additional side and you need to prove that side is actually zero on the nose. And I mean, there's some work to be done, but now it's all standard arguments you go through and, uh, and you, you can prove it and it comes out uh, nice and beautiful. I think maybe with that, uh, I can stop because that's what I wanted to tell. Thank you. Thank you, Kai. Uh, let's thank Kai. Um, any questions? If you have a question, you can either put it in chat or just talk, start talking because there's okay. no questions. Okay, so I have, I have many questions. Maybe I'll ask one or two now and then we'll stop the recording. Um, maybe my first question is, so did you compute for S1? <laughs> Actually, I haven't done it yet. Yeah, so sorry. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mean to, yes. I mean to work out the whole thing. Now, it's, uh, 
yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so you need to take the cotangent bundle of S1, which is a cylinder, and then you take some MOS functions, and, and you, you're already there, uh, because already on the MOS complex, you need to do some perturbation, because uh, you want to uh, take chain level products or co-products on the MOS complex, when you when you take some loop with itself, you need to somehow move it away. Depending on how you move it, you may get th different things. So so I started out and then realized it's not it's not all that easy. And it uh, so it, uh, I I couldn't do it like in half an hour. So so I, but I I mean to do that. Yeah. So I I mean to work it out in the case and and see precisely what comes out and how it's how it's relating to the other computations. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And somehow related to that, somehow we we. Have, is there yet an interpretation of Rabinovich fuller homology on the loop side? Yes, there is. So, so this is uh, something which we are currently writing up. Um, so I can, well, I'm not sure that you will like it, but there's a, so we have developed some, some framework to talk about product structures on cones. So, so there's a general algebraic framework, which we actually like did a lot of algebra on to, to understand that is what data do you need uh, in order to get a product on a cone so you take uh, two chain complexes uh, a chain map between them and and uh, then you have a cone of those mm -hmm. which is another chain complex uh, and you can take its homology uh, now what data you need on the original chain complexes in order to uh, induce a product on the cone and uh, we make this some definition, so it's a, some amount of data. Now, of course, you won't be satisfied because you would suggest one should, of course, go all the way to infinity and like carry all data of all higher operations. Now, we, we have some introduction where we say, okay, yeah, in principle, this is what you should do. You take two A infinity algebras and so on, but then uh, in order to keep it uh, uh, manageable, because ultimately we want to understand things on homology for now. Uh, yeah, but we the, just restrict what you actually need to get the structure on homology. But the basic idea is we, we glued the cohomology of the free loop space to the homology of the free loop space. Yeah, exactly. And by, um, one, okay. so, so then, then there's one result which we, can, which we are proving is that you can then uh, basically reinterpret Rabinowitz Fleur homology by saying, okay, you take this continuation map, which is actually zero in that case of Rabinowitz mm -hmm. Fleur homology. Yeah. And, and then uh, uh, you take its cone. And the homology of that cone is equal to, uh, sorry, no, I take it back. No, you take the continuation map for symplectic homology. Sorry. And you take its cone, and that yes. is Rabinowitz free homology. Yeah, sorry. Uh, and that continuation map is non trivial in general. Uh, yeah. and, and, uh, and then we, we're also proving that the product and co-product we directly define on Rabinowitz fleur homology coincide with the one you would algebraically induce on the cone. So this is one thing. Yes. And now, uh, now we can move to the loop space side and then we can say, okay, we understand what the continuation map is. We take loop space chains, loop space co-chains and on the chain level, we have the continuation map on chain level, which is just taking the class of a base point and multiplying it by the Euler characteristic basis. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. and then we take its cone, and now now we need just need to understand that we have all the structures that we need in order to induce a product structure on that cone, and all that can be phrased in terms of loop space. Uh, so it is essentially the chain level version of the uh, for the Chas Sullivan product for the uh, for, uh, for the loop co product and uh, some compatibility conditions that you need to check. And then you know that on the product of the, on, on the homology of the cone, you get uh, a product and a co-product and they satisfy all the relations. Yeah, so, so this is how we would define it on the loop space homology, as a homology of the cone of a continuation map going from co-chains to chains in the loop. Mm -hmm. So then it's, it's, it is in purely topological terms, but uh, yeah, okay. I, I don't know whether this is a satisfactory answer. This is best we can do for now. I mean, we've had some discussions that you could alternatively, presumably also do it by introducing a spectrum. Uh, yes, yes, but that's the same Which thing. this would be the homology, yeah? So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, are there any other questions? Could 
could you explain again how you can see that it's not co commutative and, and the reduced sympathetic homology? How you see that it's not co commutative? Yeah. Um, yes. Yes. This is. Uh, this is. I think. Uh, this is already visible also from the formulas that I wrote in the in the S one case. Here they are. Um, no, 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 and oh, okay, but on on the on symplectic homology, yeah, no. Yeah. Uh, thing is, I don't, I don't do computations directly on symplectic homology. When I say symplectic homology, I find easier the loop space homology. It is in terms of understanding the structure of uh, the theory, maybe, but uh, of. I, I, I usually cannot do computations directly on symplectic homology, so I'm using the isomorphism to loop space homology. So, but, I, but you saw, but you saw that, but you said that you can see it through some choices that you make when you define, yes. like on the continuation map. Can you just repeat that? Because I, I didn't understand. Okay, okay, okay. Well, uh, sorry, then I misunderstood your question. Yeah, I thought about it was about co-commutativity of this uh, co-product because that you see from here. Yeah, you see from here that it is not. Symmetric precisely right. because the sum is not running from zero to k, it's right, only right, running right. to k minus one, so it is not uh, co commutative. Yeah, and because we have the isomorphism to loose homology, also the co product that we define on symplectic homology on reduced symplectic homology will not be co commutative if we take the cotangent bundle of S1. Yeah. Sure, so, but I just want to say it on the definition from the on the definitions, so it is um, because your definition seems symmetric. Um, yes. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me go to to this picture. So here's the definition of the this uh, co-product on symplectic homology. So we deform our domains where we're splitting off. The continuation map on the first output or on the second output, and we interpolate between those two. Um, and now there is now some there's now some issue. It's becoming rather subtle in terms of signs. So so if I um, now to define these continuation maps, I need to make some further perturbation to get uh, to get this well defined and to get transversality. At the constant loops. So, so when the inputs and outputs are non-constant loops, then I can ju just make it generic in the sense of Fleur cylinders, and it is it will be fine. But at the constants, I need to I need to do something to make it uh, generic because at the constants I will be at some Morse function, and then it's precisely when I'm uh, taking the input and output to be the same critical point of the of the Morse function. Then uh, at the at the input. I will be doing uh, Morse e either way. One will be Morse homology, the other one will be Morse cohomology, and this cylinder will essentially uh, count the in the intersection of the unstable manifold of some critical point of the Morse function with itself. Now, th now the unstable manifold of a critical point with itself is not transverse, and you need to do something. You need to perturb it, and now. Now it depends on precisely how you do it. So to, so to get this thing well defined, we need to perturb the continuation map. And we can say we perturb the continuation map here and here in precisely the same manner, yeah, right. using the same vector field. And, and then, in fact, it will turn out to be not co-commutative. Because this is precisely what I did on the loop space side with, uh, when I computed for S1. I perturbed on both ends, just always with, this, with the same vector field. yeah. Then I get Sullivan's relation, but it will not be co-commutative. I could perturb it on one end with a vector field, and on the other hand with minus that vector field. Uh huh. And, and it turns out that will be the the perturbation which will make it co-commutative. But that will screw up Sullivan's relation. I see. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So so it's really getting into some subtlety of of some signs. To get co-commutativity, you really want to choose v and minus v on the two sides. And uh, yeah, mm -hmm. which you could, but then you lose Sullivan's relations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Kai, if you have time, maybe we'll take one more question. There's a question yeah, in sure. the chat. I, I have plenty of time. Okay, so the question in the chat is, is if there is an S1 equivariant version, 
of yes. this theory. Yes, there is, but it's not written, uh, and uh, it's 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 not even uh, in preliminary version. So, um, but I mean, I know some things which will happen in the S one equivalent case, but I haven't worked out everything. Um, so, for example, there's one nice thing happening in the S1 equivariant case uh, is that, as I explained in the beginning, if you want to define in the non-equivalent case, the product and the coproduct on the same space, I claim there's a unique such choice, which is this reduced homology, which I define. You need to precisely mod out Euler characteristic times the point class in order to have both operations defined. Now, it turns out in the S1 equivariant case, you have a choice. So you need to divide out at least Euler characteristic times the point class. And that follows from the non-equivalent case when you then do the mark and erase a la Sullivan and you see that this gives you things well defined also in the equivalent situation. But in the equivalent case, you could actually mod out more because the equivalent operation have this mark and erase in between and that leads to the fact that whenever any of the inputs is in the constant loops uh, or or any of the outputs also then then these operations just vanish uh, so there's some something happening there which makes the equivariant theory more robust so so there i think i have the whole range i need to mod out at least euler characteristic times a point and i can mod out all the constant loops and anything in between. So I could decide to mod out some of the constants or whatever. Yeah. So, so anything in that range would work and would give you both operations uh, defined. And I have not worked that out, but I, I expect they also would satisfy all the, uh, all the structures that you want. The, uh, the, you, there you expect to see uh, an uh, involutive Lie by algebra structure. And uh, I think in that whole range, you're probably going to get that. And, and, but the one interesting question, that's something that I have not had time yet to think through, is I also expect that in the equivalent case, it should also not depend on any choices. Uh, um, and, but this, uh, this I'm not entirely sure. Uh, this, I actually, this for me is, a, is still a question, um, whether this is the case. Uh, there's one reason why I think that, uh, namely that we have in the simply connected case, at least, we have an alternative approach to define this involutive Lie by algebra structure on S1 equivariant loop space homology relative to a point, to one point, not all comes to one point, uh, by using the Durham complexes and, uh, and so on and going through a, a whole lot of algebra. And, uh, uh, and that works. And that, uh, that is something which then does not, it's using a different approach. It's not using a perturbation by a vector field at all. It's just doing something in, with uh, evaluating at points and pulling back the RAM forms using Chen iterated integrals. And uh, so, so it seems that we have an alternative approach which doesn't involve any additional choices. Uh, but I, I want to check uh, directly on the loop space uh, side, whether it will be independent of choices. In the simply connected case, at least this should be the this should be true. Now, of course, S one is not simply connected, so it might be that this phenomenon is related to uh, simple connectivity somehow. Yeah. Um, but this I still don't fully understand. Okay. Um, let's thank Kai again uh, and form a part of the of the talk.